behalf of the Heritage Center, uh, Professor Balakrishnan, I would like to welcome you to this informal chat. And uh, the idea is that we go over the history, your history and your association with IIT Madras. And uh, so we'll start with uh, your life before IIT Madras. So maybe you can tell us something about where you lived, where you studied and worked. Well, I went to school at uh, primarily in Bombay and Pune. Uh, after matriculation, I had a year of pre-university science at the University of Pune. And then my father got transferred to Delhi, so I joined Delhi University uh, in the physics honors program in 1960. And in 63, I finished my physics honors. And in 65, the MSc program, and then went abroad to Brandeis University for a PhD. Uh, returned to India in late 1970, and then uh, spent three years at Tata Institute in Bombay and then joined the then new reactor research center at Kalpakkam in the material science division, what was then the material science lab. And after six years there, I moved to IIT and joined in 1980. And then, of course. So RRC is now called IGCAR, right? RRC is now called IGCAR. After Indira Gandhi passed away, the name was changed. Um, and it's. Uh, the second research arm of uh, the Atomic Energy Department after BARC. Uh, since you actually had a permanent job at uh, IGCAR or RRC as it was called, how did you end up at IIT Madras? Well, a combination of circumstances, some intentional, some accidental, uh, happy accidents in some sense for me. Uh, I always wanted to teach and in fact in uh, 1976, Professor R. Srinivasan, who was the head of the physics department, invited me to come over here from Kalpakkam three days a week and give a new course on the quantum theory of solids, which I did during the January to April semester. And the next year, he repeated the experiment. So I realized that uh, I really like teaching. So when the opportunity arose, I thought uh, I'd apply, and I did, and then I came here. So um, it's true that uh, I did spend the first decade in a pure research institution, but I felt always that something was missing, a crucial ingredient. And then after coming here, I realized it was the presence of young students that's uh, generally missing in research institutes, except for a few research scholars or very young uh, scientists. But uh, being in an institution with uh, undergraduates and postgraduate students, and the large number of them is a different feeling altogether. So in 1982, which is probably a year or two after you joined IIT Madras, I joined IIT Madras as an undergraduate. And uh, by then, you were already a legendary teacher. And I mean, it was my great regret that you were not teaching my class because you were teaching alternate batches. So the odd years had you and your yes. team teaching. Yes. But how did you be, I mean, have such a huge impact in, I think, a year or two? I don't know if it was an impact, but you have to remember that in 1980, uh, 81, the first four-year batch, BTEC batch started. Till then, it was a five-year stream. So after I came over, there was this uh, effort to rewrite the physics curriculum to compress all physics, so to speak, in three semesters. Uh, Professor Indireshan was the director who recruited me. And I remember even asking him, saying, uh, because I'd been told by people in the physics department that prior to that, in the five-year stream, they actually had physics for 10 semesters. So I even asked him, how do you expect all of physics to be compressed in three semesters? And his reply was, that's the mandate. You have to do it. Now everything else depends on how you do it and uh, surely you can communicate the essentials of a subject to potential engineers in three semesters. If you can't, it means something is wrong. So he was categorical about it. He said, you should be able to do it. So a team of us, uh, Professor R. Srinivasan, of course, taking the lead, and then uh, Dr. Swaminathan, uh, Ramabhadran, and myself, we handled the first few batches of the new four-year stream. And we wrote out the syllabus, a curriculum, which was used for many years. And we, our philosophy was roughly to say 
we avoid details and focus on principles and we talk about single particle or small number of degrees of freedom systems in the first semester along with the vector calculus. So, essentially you are doing mechanics in vectorial form. In the second semester we went on to fields electromagnetism specifically with a little bit of optics and in the third semester we looked at a very large number of degrees of freedom. So, after a brief introduction to Hamiltonian and Lagrangian mechanics we did elementary statistical mechanics and ended up with the fundamentals of quantum physics. So, that uh, was a very neat package indeed in three semesters which kind of summarized what physics uh, was all about. And I must say that the students were a much smaller number in those days. I believe that in the early 80s the number was only about 240 or 260. Even less 220 to 230 yes. I think. And then it of course has grown since then. But uh, they were split into four batches and the four of us handled these batches more or less in synchrony and uh, in, in fact I would say in strong synchrony because we discussed things beforehand. And the students were deeply interested many of them as you know very well including yourself many people went on to form in a, to careers in science and mathematics. So, it did make some difference. Even though I did not have you as a lecturer I got access to you know cyclostyle notes your legendary cyclostyle notes and can you tell us something about that? Well, I when I joined here I had a room an office room which clearly was a temporary room because uh, it had a cyclostyling machine at one end of it which was not used and uh, it had apparently been junked or whatever and it was still in working condition as far as I know and there was a technician who would occasionally run things off on it. And after a while I got this idea that uh, we could do the stenciling and type and cyclostyling ourselves and question papers in those days were cyclostyled 220 copies made for the quizzes for the final exam and so on and stapled. So, we set up a kind of uh, assembly line to do this and I had an old typewriter with me. So, we type on those old stencils fill out all the equations using those stencils and then uh, run off. I even learned how to use that cyclo styling machine how to run it off. And then once that happened it became easy to you know distribute handouts notes and so on. Of course, things are much easier now we do it by just forming an email group and then sending out PDF files or whatever. But uh, in those early days I think it did help that the students had access to notes. Because we did not in this curriculum it was so mixed that we did not really use a single textbook. Actually there is not one till today. And that caused a lot of difficulty because a lot of complaints that there was not a single textbook from which we were teaching unlike the other IITs I guess. And uh, we insisted that uh, this course was so broad based that the single textbook could not do justice to it. It was certainly at a much higher level than uh, Resnick and Halliday for instance or Beiser or anything like that. And uh, years later I had opportunity to compare this syllabus that we had laid out with corresponding syllabus at Caltech and Cornell and so on and to our great surprise it was uh, there was a very very high degree of overlap. So, in that sense we had actually modernized the physics curriculum uh, well before uh, many other places did. One of the funny things is that uh, with regard to laboratory duty it is sort of in, uh, in the physics department as you know most people are assigned uh, one session or two sessions of lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean you were assigned one, a few times, but then it was decided that it was better not to give you lab duty. <laughs> Can you tell us what Might happened? Might be a <laughs> you know realistic assessment of my uh, talents as an experimentalist which is uh, less than negligible. But I think uh, for many years through the 80s I actually handled two theory courses every semester. And one memorable semester in 1984 I had three. And uh, with a little bit of uh, for a few lectures I also handled a few lectures of in a fourth course in the same semester. I would not want to repeat that experience again <laughs> because it was a very heavy load. Yes. But two was fairly routine and so on. Which is definitely then, more than most people because it is usually one lab yeah, two and one, one course. One of them a four credit course it takes it takes away some time. But towards the end uh, in the late 90s I did get assigned lab courses etcetera. But uh, I think they found me more useful 
they found it more useful if I gave lectures on error analysis and statistics and how to analyze data than to actually go there and supervise experiments, which I could do, you know, no differently from anyone else. Mm -hmm. And one of the big surprises for me at least is that you know a lot of stuff about material science. And it's not something you work on day to day, but I know that you know so oh, much. When I, uh, my, my thesis is on elementary particle physics, theoretical high energy physics of those days, uh, S matrix theory and field theory, trying to bring them together. So that's as abstract as you could have got in those days. But then uh, when I moved to TIFR, I slowly shifted to many body theory and did work on the Heisenberg ferromagnet and statistical physics and so on. And then when I got this job at Kalpakam, it was specifically in the material science lab. So the mandate was to try to understand from a physical point of view, uh, fundamental properties of materials, specifically metals. So I had to learn a little bit of metallurgy and material science to be able to work there and contribute to the research program. So that uh, my initially I felt, I mean, this is a subject which would be totally uninteresting to me. But as I got into it, I realized that it's a fascinating subject and that sort of uh, interest, cultural interest has stayed with me till now. And uh, among the many things you already mentioned that you were very actively involved in setting up the physics curriculum for the new four-year program in the 80, 81. But, but you kept introducing new courses. So can you tell us uh, something about the course called Classical Mechanics 2, which became Classical Field Theory? Oh, that was again a bit of an accident. The very first course that I taught here was in the January, apart from the 76, 77 brief interlude. Uh, this was a course on classical mechanics too, as it was in the MSc syllabus then. Uh, and it was from January to J April or May of 1981. The class was small and what I didn't realize then was that it had some exceptionally good students, including some B.Tech students who were sitting in on the course. And in all my innocence, I went and asked them what textbook they'd use for classical mechanics one and they said Goldstein. And I said, how much of Goldstein? And they said, all of it. And I was surprised by this, that they had actually covered this entire course. I found out later that that was a little bit of a hyperbole. But I decided that if they had done all of Goldstein, then the next thing to do was to do, uh, start practically at the last chapter of Goldstein, which is continuum mechanics. And then I looked at it and said, continuum mechanics is kind of boring, so let's make it relativistic. And then I gave this course on classical field theory. One of the great advantages of academic freedom is that you could uh, kind of uh, distort the syllabus in this fashion as you pleased. The students seemed to like it, so I introduced special relativity and tensor calculus, and then did classical field theory. It went down well. I even wrote a set of notes on it and distributed it. And then in the next few years, occasionally, one would come back and give this. I think it got formalized as classical field theory only much, much later after all of you came in and then introduced a lot of general relativity and really made it a proper course on classical field theory. But I was happy to be able to do things like spontaneous symmetry breaking and the Higgs mechanism and so on way back then in the context of basic classical field theory. And uh, one course, at least for me, it's memorable by its name. And it gave, I didn't know what that was about. It was called synergetics. Can you tell us? Oh, uh, in the 80s, when people were beginning to look at complex systems, what today is known as complex systems, specifically uh, Hermann Haken in Germany, he coined, I think he coined the name synergetics for this course, where you have a large number of uh, effects coming together to produce, uh, causes coming together to produce an effect. Something like what we would call emergent phenomena or complex dynamics and so on today. And there was a whole series of monographs published on synergetics, collections of articles in, by Springer. And I found that one of the lacunae in our MSc syllabus curriculum was that there was no room for critical phenomena or phase transitions, the modern theory of critical phenomena, nor was there any non-equilibrium uh, statistical mechanics. and. There was nothing on dynamical systems per se, although chaos and nonlinear dynamics had become quite 
popular and they were very, very actively being pursued in the late 70s and 80s. And I thought, why not put these together and offer an elective for it? Strictly speaking, it should have been three electives. But the hassle of going through the Board of Academic Courses, getting permission for all the courses would have been too much. And three would have been too much to float at one, one shot. So I put the three together into one syllabus in a little bit of uh, sleight of hand and called it Synergetics. And it was approved by the Departmental Committee and the Board of Academic Courses. And then the course was floated as an MSc elective. So for several years to successive batches of MSc students as well as uh, senior BTEC students who opted for this course, I ran this course by focusing on one of these three main topics. So it was three kind of different courses, but under one umbrella. And then of course, today we have separate courses on all these subjects. So I mean, actually you have been involved in creation of dynamical systems. Mm -hmm. Now that's two courses, there's advanced. Yeah, there's an advanced. And course. then more recently you added two more courses, you know, which in some sense, seems to have its origins in synergetics. One is uh, physical applications of stochastic yes. processes yes. and non-equilibrium stat mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, uh, and in fact, you have actually given NPTEL courses right. on this. Right. So can you tell us how your NPTEL courses came about, especially the first two, which I think are uh -huh. widely popular, I mean, to uh, say the least. For entirely accidental reasons, uh, as usual. Um, this was around the time that I was actually retiring from the department formally, a little later, in fact, when I was already uh, on uh, But your classical physics and quantum physics was given to a real class. You were yes. still they were all Yes. They were given as courses. As you know, we had a minor stream which Professor Anand had proposed early. And the minor stream started off by saying in the physics minor stream, the proposal was four courses. Um, all four generally MSc electives. So for a few years, it was uh, a little chaotic because different people would take different courses or float different courses among the electives, depending on the interest of whoever taught the course. And the course wasn't receiving its pro due attention from the undergraduates. It wasn't being opted for as a leading preference. So the department decided to do something about it, and then they revamped it. There were only three courses, I think, now. Now it is uh, three, but no. it started off as four right. with two core. Right. So my suggestion at that stage was to formulate two new courses altogether for the minor stream, and then have the remaining course or two courses taken from the list of MSc electives. And the two basic courses would be an overview of classical physics and an overview of quantum physics. That was agreed to, and then I wrote to help write the curriculum, the syllabus for these courses. And then it was suggested that uh, they could perhaps be recorded, that I could give the courses for the, when they were given the first time, and they could be recorded. And that was done. And that was intended in, in, entirely as a recording for the local area network um, for internal circulation alone. They got recorded, and I get these series every day, and then I decided just give it to the student representative, which was done, and I forgot about it. And then when NPTEL came along a few years later, I was asked whether these courses could be put under part of NPTEL, and I readily agreed because I didn't see why they shouldn't be. Uh, the only thing is I didn't edit them in any way because I realized that to edit an hour of lectures takes four hours of work, and that was too much. So I said, what's and all, let it be there. And then, of course, if there are mistakes in it, it will be detected by the students and kind of self-corrected. And that's how it's remained. I did do one or two more courses of that kind. And then uh, the last few were recorded. Even the, all the courses I've given there have been courses to actual classes. They happen to have been NPTEL courses which were recorded. But uh, they Except for the series you have for high school students, which yes. is different in character. Can yeah, you tell us something about altogether. it? The mandate there was to do uh, half hour modules on 11th standard physics and on 12th standard physics in two different courses. And they were supposed to be half hour modules. Mm -hmm. I was able to do the 11th standard, but I still haven't uh, been able to do the 12th. I mean, yeah. And. Uh, you started writing articles for this uh, nice uh, journal of education called Resonance, mm -hmm. which is started by the Indian Academy of mm -hmm. Sciences. Mm -hmm. And 
I really like this series uh, called What Can the Answer Be? Mm -hmm. And I think of it as vintage Balakrishnan mm -hmm. in some sense. Can you tell us a little bit about what can the answer be? Well, Resonance started in 1996 and they were looking for articles at that time. And one of the thoughts I had was uh, supposed to be pedagogical articles, supposed to interest students in science and mathematics. And um, I was on the editorial board at that time. And one of the thoughts I had was, uh, why not put down some of the useful tricks that one uses in teaching these courses, kind of heuristic arguments, which could be made rigorous subsequently after you guess the answer, into a systematic uh, set of articles on this. So I started by writing one and then it grew to two and three and then four and then went on for a few more. Uh, and I titled it, What Can the Answer Be? The idea being, the philosophy being that you use very general arguments such as uh, linearity, superposition, isotropy, scaling, isotropy, homogeneity, um, dimensional analysis, order of magnitude estimates and so on. All the tricks of the trade of a professional scientist in trying to guess the answers to questions and then show that it is indeed um, the, the rigorous uh, answer or whatever. You can move this up to a point. But I found to my great surprise that you could illustrate fairly sophisticated concepts like uh, the reciprocal basis <coughs> for crystallography, not just in two and three, but in n dimensions. You could then go on to infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, uh, vector spaces. You could talk about uh, basis sets and change of basis and uh, the idea of completeness and over completeness, etc. So fairly sophisticated concepts could be brought in from very elementary considerations. Mm -hmm. And that's how this series grew. Uh, I, I must say I regret mm -hmm. not having uh, contributed more towards that set of articles, but they're sort of time consuming. <laughs> Though I must admit that uh, some of my lectures now are titled, uh, what can the answer mm -hmm. be? And the lecture uh, proceeds in I, a I fashion imitating I yours. That, I don't know where I got that title from. It may not, it may not be an original thought. Sorry. I always tell them we are going to Im imitate Professor Balki as you are called. We are going to imitate Professor Balki today. We are going to say what can the answer be. Of course, be. the greats in <laughs> physics have always used such arguments. As you yeah. know, the fine, uh, Feynman and Fermi and so on are legendary figures who have used such arguments. Fermi is famous back of the envelope calculations and uh, Feynman's uh, heuristic way of arguing even complex uh, um, problem, yeah. problems out. They are object lessons in how to do this. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your family? I know that you are, both your kids, your son and daughter, studied at IITM. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I would like your, uh, you to tell us a little bit about your family and your mm -hmm. influence in them getting into IIT. Influence oh. or lack of influence? <laughs> well. Um, my wife is a theoretical physicist. We were uh, students together at Delhi University and then at graduate school at Brandeis. And uh, she worked at IMSC till her retirement. And uh, when our children grew up, uh, we have a son who is seven years older than our daughter. And when he grew up, uh, well, he went to KVIIT here. Um, one of the things I realized very early on is that I simply didn't have the patience to be able to teach him anything. Uh, it's just that I think many parents have this problem with at least their first child. They think they can download all their information and experience at several tera whatever it is, <laughs> teraflops per second <laughs> into their children instantaneously and get impatient if they don't absorb all of this at once. That doesn't work. It doesn't work that way at all. So uh, my wife was very sane about it. And she said, well, uh, let's give inputs to the kids only when they ask for it, which of course was not very often. And this, this turned out to be very helpful. So we really didn't uh, you know, interfere in any way or pressure in any way. As long as they were doing OK, it was fine with us. It's only when uh, Hari, that's my son's name, when he got to about uh, maybe the 10th standard or something that he showed some interest in uh, problem solving in mathematics and so on. He got into these various quizzes and then uh, these Olympiad kind of 
problem solving with some friends. He had some very good friends. And uh, so he wrote the IIT entrance exam and got in here into the computer science program. Um, long after he graduated, my daughter, who went to a state board school, and we didn't expect that she would be interested in anything scientific at all. So she said she one fine morning she told my wife that she would like to take the IIT entrance exam. And then uh, I mean, by this time, long before this, a promise had been extracted from me that I won't interfere in any way whatsoever, which I, was all the more true in her case. No, but and I remember one legendary story is that you came proudly and announced to me and, uh, and Professor Lakshmi Bala over tea that uh, you taught, tried to teach your daughter complex analysis well, and I, uh, you should tell us your wife's reaction to that. Yes, I, I must say that the <laughs> residue uh, theorem, it was, yeah. it, was, it was a mistake because uh, I felt that she was probably in her seventh or eighth or something like that. I felt that uh, talking about real numbers was meaningless without introducing complex variables. So I tried to do that geometrically. And uh, the poor child was totally confused. You do, yeah, equation uh, of a circle in, uh, yeah, in polar so, coordinates. Right. So I said the equations of common curves in, in, comp in terms of a complex variable become very simple. For example, a circle becomes mod z equal to a. Very obvious. And then, of course, this uh, totally went over her head and it was a disaster. So then uh, I decided to follow my wife's advice and not interfere in this matter at all. I think she Children told you to stick to, to being her chauffeur. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so I think uh, it's a good, good idea not to interfere till help is asked for and then to stick to just that. The other thing I learned by uh, getting involved with them was uh, you shouldn't, uh, it's true you should explain the basics. But very often they want an instant answer to whatever the problem is at that moment. And if you start going too far back and starting from their basics, then they feel their foundations are shaken completely and then they don't know which way to move. They don't have a mooring. So it's important not to destroy that. You know. uh, one more thing which I would like to discuss now is the evolution of the physics department. So uh, around the time you joined, I remember it was mostly a department of experimental solid state mm -hmm. physics. Mm -hmm. And uh, today it's evolved to uh, being one of the largest departments mm -hmm. in IIT Madras and having a wide spectrum mm -hmm. of, uh, of topics. I mean, it's probably, one could even argue that it's one of the better physics departments among mm -hmm. all IITs. So, could I, you just... I go uh, further and say it's the best. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, I know that uh, you were also involved in this uh, sort of slow but sure shift. So, mm -hmm. could you tell us something? Well, clearly, uh, historically, the department started with emphasis in experimental solid state physics, or what was then solid state physics of a particular kind, uh, specifically things like color centers and uh, uh, you know, conventional band structure calculations and so on. And Professor Srinivasan had uh, set up very early on an extremely successful low temperature physics program, cryogenics and low temperature physics experimental program. That must, it must be said that that was one of the country's first such programs. That we had a helium plant, right? a helium plant working which, helium plant. Which arrived here, I believe, in 1970 or 71, and uh, which was a kind of one of a kind facility in this part of the country at that time, apart from maybe BRC or TIFR. So that was a very significant uh, achievement of the physics department. But after that, it uh, focused essentially on one subject, one part of one subject. And it was not even uh, geared to uh, other developments in condensed matter physics, such as the whole theory of critical phenomena and even the experimental study of critical phenomena and stuff like that. But then over the years, uh, it started slowly expanding as it should, as it must inevitably. And more and more people came in very slowly at first and then a little faster later on in recent years. Till today, I think we have a reasonably healthy balance. Uh, certainly, the experiment to theory balance was uh, skewed in the early days. No one knows what the ideal balance is in a physics department, but certainly <coughs> two to one ratio would not be too bad. Which is what it's roughly now. I think. Which perhaps is what it is now. Two to one or even maybe, you know, uh, 
5 to 2 or something like that would be all right. Um, but that was not attained in those days and it did it, it was a lacuna and that I am very happy to say that to see that it is uh, been kind of redressed. Uh, we have very good people now and I think the institute as a whole of course and then the department in particular is certainly on an upward trajectory. I would go so far as I said this to the review committee when they came and of course I had retired by then but I said so I could say this in a very casual and irresponsible way and perhaps the review committee felt a little taken aback by this. They smiled uh, and they said the department was a good one. I said it is the best one among the IITs and then of course uh, maybe that is arguable but I, I would say that uh, we certainly have today an extremely vibrant department which is extremely active both research and teaching wise. Yeah. Uh, you are very well known as a teacher. But uh, personally, I think uh, you are even more remarkable as a scientist. And so, let us just talk a little bit about your research. I also know that uh, it is not like you be, uh, you worked on one topic, your thesis was on S matrix theory, high, uh, you know, theoretical high energy physics, and then promptly in your first postdoc, you were doing many body theory and it evolved over the years. So, could you tell us a little bit of the kind of problems you worked on and the evolution of your research? Um, it, I kind of fell into these problems uh, out of curiosity kind of more or less uh, by chance in some sense. So, when I um, was in TIFR, I slowly shifted out of high energy physics which had gone in a different direction then and the reason was that the gauge theories had just come in, electroweak unification had just been demonstrated. Uh, two papers had just come in and I did not have enough field theory background to be able to follow this and contribute in terms of research. But by that time I had also found an interest in many body theory and statistical physics. So, I did some work on the Heisenberg ferromagnet, green functions for it, low temperature properties and so on. And then uh, slowly moved out when I went to Kalpakam the shift was to material science and we set ourselves the task of doing something new which is to understand uh, mechanical relaxation using linear response theory. So, that is how you got into linear response theory right. through mechanical exactly. relaxation. Through, through okay. mechanical relaxation because there is a well established theory of dielectric relaxation and magnetic relaxation and the idea was there should be a parallel in mechanics and there is except that it is for very low strains and it is things like an elasticity and linear viscoelasticity which are not of direct interest to metallurgists. It did not take long for me to realize that the really hard problems in metallurgy are nonlinear, intrinsically extremely complicated nonlinear complex systems. But as a baby step, one could look at the linear regime, the time dependent elasticity in the linear regime. And sure enough, it turned out that if you looked at the dynamics of defects using stochastic as well as statistical methods, you could formulate. Uh, 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 an approach to mechanical relaxation, things like an elastic creep and stress relaxation and so on, on the same footing as that for dielectric and magnetic relaxation. And you had the same role played by fluctuation dissipation theorems and both the first and second ones in this. So, we developed that for a few years. That kind of got me interested in random processes and stochastic processes. And after coming here, I looked at the problem of hydrogen diffusion in metals which is a very complicated diffusion problem. It has got mixing of uh, classical and quantum properties here, diffusion here and that led me to looking at random box and random box has stayed a kind of uh, uh, recurring interest for the last 35, 40 years now, many years now. So, that is one aspect of it. Um, my first students here we did things on random box and diffusion and generalized diffusion, anomalous diffusion. Um, continuous time random box, first passage times and so on for several years through the decades, uh, uh, the 80s and into the early 90s. So, uh, you were actually being very productive at a time when you were teaching 2 to 3 theory courses. Yeah, surprisingly the semesters I had the maximum teaching load, I also felt obliged to do the maximum amount of research because I felt guilty that I was not you know spending enough time on that. So, yes, I think when you are kept busy then you tend to work harder when you when you have a lot of things to do. Uh, 
Then in the 90s, I slowly switched to dynamical systems and had a few papers on nonlinear dynamics, got into chaos and stuff like that. Uh, and then a little later into back to quantum physics to isospectral oscillators, generalized coherent states, things. These were all tailored to what students were on at the time and what the thesis topics would be like. Uh, and now and you're working on quantum on dynamics. quantum dynamics because there's this uh, fascinating world of uh, quantum optics and uh, atom optics and uh, uh, kind of coming together of uh, uh, fundamental quantum mechanics, operator theory, uh, the behavior of, in a nutshell, the behavior of quantum mechanical systems which show all the normal complexities of quantum physics like entanglement and uh, multipartite systems interacting with each other. Uh, along with uh, the fact that classically these are chaotic systems. So signatures of chaos as they translate into these systems, uh, signatures of non-classicality uh, in uh, mainly in uh, photonic systems, etc. So it's a hodgepodge of many things, but there's an underlying method in the madness, there's a theme um, which uh, Professor Lakshmi Bala and I have been exploring for many years, which is to understand using expectation values of physical observables and their higher moments and the expectation values of cor and correlators and things like that in quantum systems. And your Regarding ideas of recurrence from the early days is coming back in some sense. Right? Yes, uh, yes, there are deep connections between revival phenomena in quantum physics wave packet revival phenomena, fractional revivals, full revivals on the one hand and recurrences in the Poincare sense in classical dynamical systems. So I have got some papers on uh, uh, recurrent statistics, recurrent time statistics in different kinds of chaotic systems including intermittent systems and then ranging all the way from quasi periodic to chaotic, fully developed chaotic systems and each of them has uh, their own peculiarities for the recurrence time distributions. And the idea was to explore if there are connections with revivals and fractional revivals in the corresponding quantum counterparts to this. And we have some interesting results. So the whole idea is to see uh, to what extent phase space descriptions can play a role in quantum mechanics. As you know, on the one side you have the Wigner distribution and its generalizations. But on the other side, you could also take a na more naive approach and look at expectation values of uh, observables and their higher powers and cross correlators and so on. Treat them as uh, dynamical variables in some effective phase space and see what the plots look like and what signatures of quantum physics they carry here. That's been a kind of general program, ongoing program for about two decades now. Uh, one feature of your research uh, which I personally like a lot is the fact that uh, you come up with exact solutions. Exact by mean there are no approximations to, illu uh, to illustrate non-trivial behavior. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can tell us about a couple of them. So that well, I think it's just a personal uh, like in some sense because uh, I'm not very strong in numerics or in co computation. The students are. And I rely on them entirely for this purpose. But at the same time, I've always felt that if you have a model uh, which captures some of the essential features that you want to explain for more complicated systems, then it's worth solving the model as exactly as possible because any reliability that you place on the uh, results from this model shouldn't be dependent on the approximations that you made. Uh, on the other hand, if you start with a model which is already a caricature of reality or a real physical system and then you make further approximations to it and they get uncontrolled, then any results that you get, you have no way of deciding whether it's an artifact of the approximations or whether the model has captured whatever you wanted to do. There's this uncertainty and it's difficult to decide what to do in such a case. So it, it would be good to have analytic solutions to simple models. But of course, what happens in most cases is that these analytic solutions occur for models, are possible only for models which are extremely simple and oversimplify the real situation. So the trick is to find systems which are not 
oversimplified, but which at the same time can be analytically solved, like one dimensional models for example, very often are solvable, but they may not have real features that you may want to capture. Just to give you an instance, not something I worked on, even if you know that the one dimensional easing model does not have a phase transition in the standard sense, you would still like to understand correlation functions or the renormalization decimation procedure from these one dimensional models where it can be implemented exactly. So, they still have valuable lessons to give for more complicated systems. Okay, so, the last part we will just, uh, you mean writing books over the years. In fact, uh, your first book was written when you were at uh, in Kalpakam. So, can you just tell us something about the various books that you have written? Uh, the first book was not written, it was written with uh, you were uh, already in IIT Madras. I was already in IIT ah, Madras okay. when it was published. It was a Springer Ferrilla book on uh, the solid state sciences. We had in Kalpakam looked at topological defects in condensed matter a little bit, did not do much original research on it, but we looked at uh, what kind of arrangements could understand, how you could understand the structure of glass. So, it was basically a disordered system and there were ideas floating around at that time due to the French school particularly that maybe their regular tilings in curved spaces and when projected onto Euclidean space they look disordered the way they do. That is an oversimplified idea, but in that connection there were uh, uh, proposition, there were uh, suggestions to have uh, quote unquote gauge theory of glass using the gauge theory of defects and dislocations and disclinations which had been developed by people in continuum mechanics. Uh, now, that program did not really go too far at that time, but uh, we decided to write a short monograph uh, explaining in very simple terms the notions of symmetry, broken symmetry, broken ergodicity and then give an introduction to gauge theories um, in this context and that was the Springer book which came out in 89. It is called Beyond the Crystalline State because it dealt with things beyond the normal lattice dynamics of crystals. We even included a little bit about quasi periodicity, incommensurate phases, Penrose tiling and so on. Um, later on, uh, much later I wrote this book on non-equilibrium statistical mechanics based on the courses I have given here. Basically, this was after retirement or? Uh, the book was published in 2008. But I had the, yeah, in the last the year or two of retirement, I had already started collecting material on this. It was a set of notes that I had written when I was in Kalpakam as a report and then that got elaborated. And uh, the book should have been written earlier, but I just did not do it. And then uh, after 2010, I started collecting material which I had been giving on earlier courses in mathematical physics. And uh, it was, that book has been published this year, late last year and early this year. Uh, that was a uh, major effort. It took me more years than I thought it would. I thought I would finish it in two years. It took me four times as long, about three and a half times as long. And uh, I know that you are working on uh, many more uh, book projects. And uh, so, what is your, what are you currently working on? Uh, I, when I started this math physics book seriously, I put on the back burner a book on problems and solutions in nonlinear dynamics, which uh, in all these books, I wanted to have a, a point of view before one would start writing a book. And in the case of this nonlinear dynamics book, the point of view is that I would like to lay equal emphasis on Hamiltonian or conservative systems as on dissipative systems and equal emphasis on discrete time dynamics as on continuous time dynamics. So, maps and flows. Uh, with that view, I have uh, several chapters already. I am well into the book, I would say about it is about two thirds complete and I hope to finish it fairly soon. And what are the other projects in the anvil? Uh, well, there are several research problems which I should pay more attention to, um, for which every now and then I get scattered away from it. Uh, there is a, a kind of desire to write another book of problems and solutions on conventional statistical physics. I have the material ready, it is just got to be latex, I have not done that uh, and then it has to be expanded and uh, that would be one uh, thing which I'd, I have a couple more distant dreams, but I am not sure whether uh, one at a time I think. Excuse me, by the time you join the physics department had stopped doing demonstrations during the 
first year students. Mm -hmm. No. The physics lecture theatre and chemistry theatre, mm -hmm. they used to conduct the first oh, year yes. classes because yes. they used to show sort of masters. Oh, yes. Well, even after I joined, this went on for many years. Even in 2014, and I actually had yeah. demonstrations. You had it? Yeah. Uh, because Professor, from the time of Professor Koch yeah. and uh, Dr. Rang Shastri, mm -hmm. it had started. Yeah, they, and in fact, they used to have the classes only in those two yes. lecture theatres. The, the lecture theatre was built specifically so that they could actually illustrate mechanics. They had a lot of very beautiful demonstrations uh, equipment, piece of equipment from Germany. And in particular, they had this huge turntable on which you could place two chairs and right. then you could have a rotating frame of reference, illustrate all the non uh, inertial forces and the rotating of wheel. angular momentum. <laughs> yes, it's a pity that these went out, partly because I think the curriculum got abbreviated, got foreshortened, it was assumed. Uh, I remember distinctly that in the 80s, it was specifically stated almost that uh, Students had already read, those who got into IIT had already absorbed what was in Resnick and Halliday and therefore there was no reason to repeat elementary mechanics anymore. And it got an early, you know, it, it, it was discouraged to some extent, the curriculum didn't have space for this and then gradually no, but still the there were of, demonstrations. We still have and I think it, few times. wherever it's uh, possible it should be revived, but in the presence of, uh, in the availability of very good animation and things on and YouTube. Uh, on YouTube, this has become a little passe. But I still think that a live demonstration, nothing like it. I mean, I remember not too many years ago going to a school and then they had issues with understanding in the 12th standard electromagnetic waves. The idea that you have transverse waves with electric and magnetic fields in perpendicular directions oscillating and then the propagation in the third direction. We have a beautiful piece of equipment where you have rods in two perpendicular directions colored differently and you rotate a wheel and there's this beautiful wave prop motion which appears to propagate. And that single piece of equipment is worth dozens of pages in textbooks and explanations because all you have to do is to rotate this wheel and students understand instantaneously what polarization is and what transverse waves are. So in that sense, I think that these demonstrations should be to the extent possible revived. Unfortunately, the classes are extremely large now. And <coughs> also, uh, my experience from 2014 was that uh, we had uh, 850 students and so PHLT can hold 200. So what we did, we broke, that, broke them up into four batches. And turns out that uh, many of them were not interested because attendance was not compulsory. And uh, the, when I mentioned this to students who graduated maybe, you know, six, seven years ago, they said, sir, we used, may have bunked classes, but we never missed the demonstration. Yeah. Also, you get chocolates, you're asked <laughs> questions, and you, you get chocolates. And that was, you know, they said, you know, I remember uh, PHLT would be filled and people sitting in the stairs, you know, not the seats were not enough. And, uh, but times have changed in some sense. I have another question. You were uh, notes to the NPTEL. Mm -hmm. This is meant at the uh, mm -hmm. for MS standard, mm -hmm. master standard, mm -hmm. or is it at the at the engineering students only? The it books, I mean, the lectures you have done under NPTEL. Uh, the courses on overview of classical physics and overview of quantum physics were specifically undergraduate courses. They were part of the minor stream. On the other hand, I did introduce topics, especially in the second course on quantum mechanics and in the course on quantum physics. I did introduce some topics which were a little more advanced and the notes do contain some material which uh, is uh, more advanced on operator theory and so on. Um, the courses on mathematical physics and uh, stochastic processes and non equilibrium, non -equilibrium and statistical physics. These are MSc courses, these are MSc level courses. Although in all the courses that I have taught throughout my career at IIT, um, they have always been open to undergraduates. I have always given consent of teacher for whatever, uh, to whoever wants to attend these courses. Uh, although undergraduates maybe in the first year or two may not be able to, um, would not have enough background material to take these courses. But in the third and fourth years I have had large numbers of undergrads. 
taking these courses as electives. The reason I asked you was, you know, uh, Ramakrishna, Vekki, mm -hmm. from Bilal, yeah. mm -hmm. he talks about the Berkeley lectures which mm -hmm. he learned in Baroda University. Yes. And of course, uh, IIT Kanpur, they were talking about Richard Feynman's lectures, mm -hmm. two volumes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, those are meant for the bachelor's level or at the uh, master's level? But, Feynman's okay. or the Berkeley lectures. Yeah, let me take the Feynman lectures first. He gave them in the early 60s to undergraduates, First. but as is well known from what he has said in, uh, in the book itself, as the lectures went on, more and more undergraduates dropped out and more and more graduate students and faculty members attended ah. the lectures, so they were learning. So clearly Feynman's viewpoint was so original and things were so beautifully meshed together and brought in that it's only people who already had a knowledge of the subject at some basic level could appreciate this. So it's like, you know, a, a, an exquisite music concert. And the lectures themselves, apart from the first volumes, initial lectures, reflect this because the topics are absolutely eclectic, everything is brought together, you see this incredible unity of the subject, but it's not a textbook for beginners, certainly. On the other hand, the Berkeley Physics course was a deliberate effort to have a five volume set of uh, books accessible to undergraduates and it's my personal opinion that to this day they remain the very best set of textbooks for undergraduate physics. Um, book one is on mechanics, book two is on electricity and magnetism, book three is on waves and oscillations, four is on quantum physics, uh, four is on statistical physics and five is on quantum physics or vice versa. They are all written by extremely uh, competent people, very, very good people and the textbooks are brilliant in their own way. And they and are at a Purcell's lower level, introduction of, Purcell's introduction of magnetism book. is… Absolutely. So each of the books is a gem. Uh, Rife's book on statistical, statistical physics, physics is an absolute gem. If a student reads, goes through those books, he or she doesn't need anything else for undergraduate. I would say BSc physics you are achieving. And I would say a good part of the masters too, except for specialized subjects. And in that sense, I think the Berkeley physics course, which is available in an inexpensive edition in India today, is a great help and you know, I very strongly recommend it to colleges, to students everywhere in the country. Uh, so Park, can I ask you about the yes. connection that you mentioned with Professor Srinivasan Menu, mm -hmm. which brought you to IIT? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that? How did you meet him? What happened? I'm not very sure exactly. I don't recall exactly when I met him first. Uh, there was in this. Uh, of course, I came here in '76 and '77, as I mentioned. And Professor Srinivasan by that time already was well known to be the leading expert in low temperature physics. So people in Kalpakam were interested in this here. Uh, and on trips to Madras, I have visited IIT during that time. We come in a mini bus to do various things in, in Chennai. And I have spent days in IIT and looked at the low temperature lab and got to know him then. And we have a working helium plant. I mean, it was fascinating, absolutely. And I got to know him then and uh, it was a Srinivasan and uh, my old uh, boss at Kalpakam, Dr. G. Venkatraman, a very well-known physicist from the Atomic Energy Department. They were close friends, they are contemporaries and close friends. I believe they were even college mates, maybe not within a year or two of each other, I guess, uh, Presidency College. And uh, they knew each other very well. So I got to know Professor Srinivasan through Dr. G. V., as we call him. And then uh, he suggested that a, a course on quantum theory of solids, kind of modernizing solid state physics, be framed and taught in IIT. And I think uh, Dr. G. V. suggested my name for it. Was that for the, I mean, there were only MSc students there. There were only MSc students in that course. So I started giving that course here. I would come three days a week in the mini bus and then give the course and spend the day here and go back in the evening. And uh, as the course got uh, given, it, I, I had a full room of people and they were not all MSc students. There were many research scholars here and there were students from the theoretical physics department at, I, at the University of Madras. Because Professor Matthews heard that this course was being given and he suggested I guess. It was not a credited course. It was an MSc elective. So I didn't take care of the administrative part of the course since I was not a faculty member yes. here. 
So I don't know who graded the course and who gave the, you know, who gave the grades and so on. But it was an MSc elective at that time. And but you mentioned university students. How did the, they, how did the university students? Uh, uh, Professor Matthews, he is a contemporary of uh, Professor Srinivasan's and uh, Devi's. So he heard about this course, I guess, and then he suggested that some of his students attend it here. Just so auditing, they, I guess. They would audit, they audited the course. So the notes that I made for this course, I did a lot of reading up and so on. I wrote as a reactor research center report, a big report, and sent it out to various people. And I didn't take their suggestion. Uh, people suggested that I should make it into a little book. And I should have done it at that stage, of course. But uh, the notes, the, the report was quite popular. Many copies were distributed to people and so on. And then in the second year, in 77, Professor Srinivasan said I should repeat it since it had been favorably received the first time. And after that, uh, uh, he was, uh, he expressed interest in my coming to IIT. He said I should really come here and you know, teach. And the opportunity didn't present itself till 1980 or so. And then when it did, I did take his advice and applied. That's good for IIT. I, I would like to also ask you about the colleagues you had in those early years in the 1980s and uh, what the facilities in the department at that time. Uh, I'm pretty sure the facilities were nowhere near what they have now. That's very obvious. Um, as far as uh, I was concerned, since the only facilities I needed were Cyclostelic <laughs> paper machine. and pencil and a waste basket. <laughs> so, I didn't feel the need for, you know, I didn't feel any lack of facility. There was plenty of academic freedom here. And uh, Professor Indreshan was the director. And uh, he essentially, I think, uh, had a lot to do with the, the credit-based semester system here in this institute. And he gave complete academic freedom to people. And, he introduced, I think he introduced relative grading. I won't know because I don't know what the system was before I came here. But the very first courses that I taught in physics one, I still remember uh, we had to fit a Gaussian uh, to it. And then there was a, uh, you yeah. gave, you, you put cutoffs and then those who had full attendance were shifted into the, that they were given a little you had, extra right? thing to move if them you had into, if you were within a certain range. So it was an elaborate exercise. I have one story to tell about uh, may not, my memory may not be totally accurate to tell about uh, the grading, the very first course that I taught uh, in, in the undergraduate program in 81. It was Physics 1 in the semester July to December of 1981. And uh, out of the total number of students who took Physics 1, the grades in those days were not S A just A B C D E E A B C D U. There was A B C D and U F. U or for fail. fail. If I remember correctly, yeah. There was an F for fail. And we drew this. I drew this histogram. There were four of us teaching it, and uh, myself, Professor Srinivasan, Ramabhadran, and Swaminathan. And we went strictly by the book. We drew this graph. It was a beautiful Gaussian. There were 240 students in the class, and we gave this. It was very difficult to get the Gaussian. Yes, but the number of A's Small number given in the course was a handful, like six or seven out of 240. This created some comment because it said, uh, I still remember being told this, it said, well, the number is much larger in chemistry, it's much larger in computer science, much larger in mathematics. How come it's so hard in physics? It's impossible. So, you know, I kind of shrugged my shoulders and said, that's what, the, that's what it says here, because if you did 1.2 times the standard deviation and you went beyond it and gave A grades, that's the number. And you, by definition, you've said A is outstanding or excellent, B is very good, C is fair, and D is marginal, and E, F is fake. So I take that literally. And <laughs> the matter was taken up, and then I had to explain that um, I was asked whether physics was different in any way, to which I kind of said, maybe intemperately, I said, yes, it's different. And I was asked, how, how it's, why is it so different? Then I kind of tried to explain that while mathematics was something which there was a set of rules of calculus or whatever they were teaching, real analysis, and if you mastered those rules, you mastered the subject. 
Chemistry likewise. Chemistry, they did not try to explain the quantum theory of valence, which is very hard. They said there is this element has this valence and this valence and so on and that was the end of it. And computer science also was a set of rules. But physics was a situation where according to the syllabus we had, you took a physical system and you changed, you formulated a physical phenomenon in mathematical terms, solved the equations that arose using mathematical tools which the students were just learning and then reinterpreted the solution back in physical terms. And this two way translation is hard enough for professionals, much harder for young students. So, that is why physics at that level is more difficult than chemistry or mathematics or computer science. At least so I thought and so I felt. And in any case, this uh, apparently had reached Professor Indreshan's ears. Was not his daughter part of the class? Pardon me? His daughter? I am not sure if she was also she in was, the class. She was, she was in that might class. Might have been. She is one year my senior. So. Uh -huh. But in any case, the grades fell where they fell. And Professor Indreshan casually met me one day near the ad block. <laughs> and by this time, I realized post facto that it had gone to him and so on. Because, you know, I stuck to the grades and we, we as a team stuck to the grades and so on. So, he said, it appears that you are very harsh in grading. <laughs> I said, I've taken aback. And then he added as he passed by, he kind of said, but fair, so it's okay. And then he went off. <laughs> I still remember that. And, uh, so, uh, Professor Balakrishnan, thank you so much thank you. for giving the Heritage Center your time. Thank you very much. My again. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.